1879. The beginning of radio, television, the washer, dryer, toaster. The beginning of the X-ray tube, the nuclear power plant. This is America's most prolific inventor, the young Thomas Edison, inventing the first practical light bulb. The beginning of General Electric. Edison remained active for over half a century after that first bulb. He knew and worked with many famous General Electric scientists and engineers. Here is Thomas Edison, portrayed by the distinguished actor Pat Hingle, as he reminisces in 1928 about his work and the work of other GE people. Some people have called the light bulb my greatest invention. I'd have to disagree. It wasn't the light bulb or the phonograph or the motion picture. I think my greatest invention was the commercial research lab, a place where I could develop all kinds of inventions. I built the very first commercial research lab in the world in Menlo Park, New Jersey in 1876. You could say that was the start of the General Electric Company. Of course, I didn't know it at the time. At Menlo Park, we had as many as 44 different inventions underway at the same time. Sometimes you couldn't hear yourself think. Of course, in my case, that didn't really matter. I've been deaf since I was 12 years old. It was my goal to turn out a minor invention every 10 days and a big thing every six months or so. Two of my big things were the light bulb and the power plant. They had to be developed at the same time because I had no hope of selling the light bulb if there was no electricity. And I had no hope of selling electricity unless there was a light bulb. The company I set up to sell the light bulb was called the Edison Electric Light Company. Later, that turned into the General Electric Company. Uh, how did I get into the whole inventing business anyway? Quite frankly, I saw it as a way to make some money. When I was a newsboy, I learned that money can be made out of a little careful thought. And being poor, I already knew that money was a valuable thing. I think boys who don't know that are under a disadvantage greater than deafness. Some people give me credit for being the man who put electricity to work in America. Not completely true. A lot of people had a hand in it. Thompson, Bradley, Steinmetz. Charlie Steinmetz, queer looking duck, not even five foot tall, with an enormous head, and inside that head was an enormous brain. And Charlie had a heart even bigger than his brain. Shortly after he arrived in this country, Steinmetz came to work for us at General Electric. Those were exciting times at GE, the beginning of the age of electricity. Some of the top scientists and engineers in the country were there. Ideas were bouncing around like marbles. Steinmetz started working with alternating current, the type of electricity we all use today. I thought it was a fool idea. I favored direct current. Of course, that couldn't be transmitted more than two miles, but I didn't see that as any real problem. That was the biggest blunder of my life. If people had listened to me, then we'd have power plants all over the country every two miles. Well, Charlie kept on working at it, kept on calculating. The big test came at Niagara Falls in 1894. GE built a transformer and strung a line to Buffalo 26 miles away. The switch was thrown in Niagara. The lights came on in Buffalo. Steinmetz once told me he was almost refused admission at Ellis Island as an unfit immigrant. It's funny. One of the men most responsible for the electrification of America was almost turned away at its gate. It was Christmas Eve, 1906. The night one man startled all the ships at sea. Ernst Alexanderson. Those were the early days of radio. 
Radio in those days was used mostly for sending Morse code messages short distances. Radio intrigued Alexanderson. He'd been working with it since shortly after joining us at General Electric. Alexanderson developed the equipment that made it possible to send a voice signal. A signal that would leap the ocean all the way to Europe. Well, you can imagine how surprised all those radio operators at sea were, just sitting there listening to ta 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 dash dash when all of a sudden a voice comes booming through the earphones. The human voice on radio for the first time ever. Alexanderson was involved in every step of radio from then on. Now he's involved with broadcasting pictures, an idea called television. He's made the first television broadcast ever. It's interesting. The same man was involved in the world's first radio broadcast and the first television broadcast. Alexanderson, incidentally, invented his way into the engineering department at General Electric. He was working in our testing department. While he was there, he came up with an idea for his first invention. So he was given a desk in engineering, just until he could finish his invention. But by that time, he had another invention in the works, and another, and another. So far, 190 different inventions. More inventions than anyone else in the history of General Electric. After me, of course. He must want to keep that desk in engineering pretty bad. When I developed that first light bulb in 1879, it was hailed as a miracle. That bulb, incidentally, was really the start of the General Electric Company. It didn't take long, though, for people to start finding fault with the miracle. Some people said it was too red, too hot, too dim, burned out too quickly. What was needed was a totally new kind of filament. Which brings me to Dr. William Coolidge. Dr. Coolidge and the other scientists at the General Electric Research Lab thought the ideal filament would be made out of tungsten. But tungsten was a metal more brittle than dry bone, more fragile than an eggshell. It couldn't be bent, couldn't be shaped. How then could it be turned into wire? Will Coolidge didn't know much about metallurgy, but he wanted to give it a try. Coolidge was a young man at the time. It's a good thing, too, because only a young man could have had the stamina to work at it for six long years, from morning into night, month after month. But after six years and an infinite amount of patience, Dr. Coolidge had an answer. He turned tungsten into a wire one-sixth the thickness of a human hair and stronger than any substance known to man. It was an enormous achievement. It's as if he'd taken flour and turned it into a wire stronger than a steel cable. By 1914, that wire was saving people more than $200 million a year in electricity costs. When Dr. Coolidge showed me that first piece of tungsten wire in the lab, he told me if he had known anything about metallurgy, he never could have come up with an answer because he would have known it couldn't be done. I once said, genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. I left out something. Curiosity. Show me a genius and I'll show you a man driven by curiosity. Which brings me to the most curious man I ever met, Irving Langmuir. Langmuir was born curious with a sense of wonder about anything and everything in the universe. Wondering came to him as naturally as breathing. For instance, he'd flop down on a frozen lake for hours on end, looking through a magnifying glass, watching air bubbles form on the surface of the ice. Just out of curiosity. Langmuir thought he'd have to teach at a university in order to feed his sense of wonder, but then he met Dr. Whitney, the first director of the General Electric Research Laboratory in Schenectady. Dr. Whitney told Langmuir if he came to work for GE, he could do whatever research he felt like doing. Dr. Whitney used to walk through the lab every morning asking everyone, are you having any fun? 
After three years of this, Langmuir told Whitney, I am having a lot of fun, but I don't know what good that is to General Electric. That's not your worry, said Whitney. That's mine. What Langmuir didn't know was that the experiments he'd already done would one day give scientists a clear picture of the atom for the first time ever. This revolutionized both chemistry and physics. Langmuir may well be the first industrial scientist to win the Nobel Prize. Irving Langmuir. He once told me everything I've ever done, I've done for the fun of it. Dr. Whitney would say, that's the whole idea. Some people have called my generation the generation of genius. In just the 50 years between 1875 and 1925, we developed the telephone, the electric light, the radio, the automobile, the airplane, motion pictures, the x-ray. It's surprising how many of these things General Electric and I have been involved in. Now people are saying there's nothing left to be discovered. There won't be any more big inventions. That's nonsense. No generation has any monopoly on genius. Every generation will have its Steinmetzes, Alexandersons, Langmuirs, maybe even an Edison. There are still problems to be solved. The oil and gas we have won't last forever. We're going to have to find a new source of energy. Langmuir thinks the atom may be the answer. Or take the airplane. It doesn't fly far enough or fast enough. We ought to be able to develop a plane that can go from coast to coast in hours. Uh, Will Coolidge has already put electricity to work in hospitals with his x-ray, but I think this is just the beginning of what electricity can do in medicine. Many of these things they're working on right now at the General Electric Research Lab in Schenectady. I expect GE will keep on hiring the best people they can find and keep giving them their heads. And they're going to keep coming up with the answers. I have no pessimism about the future. As a friend of mine says, I object to people running down the future. I'm going to live all the rest of my life there. Today, General Electric is continuing to use science and technology to help